Why are there beings at all? And why not rather nothing? Welcome to Philosophers Explained by me, Stephen Hicks. This series covers major philosophers, core texts in the history of philosophy, especially the great classics, which are classics for good reason. From each, I've selected an excerpt, 30, 40 minutes, no more than an hour, and our purpose is to do a close reading of an important work with the accompanying text. In this episode, we are turning to Martin Heidegger and his 1929 inaugural lecture at the University of Freiburg, where he'd been appointed professor. What is metaphysics? Let's go to the text. All right, I want to begin by uh, noting the first and last sentences of this essay, and it's interesting that both of them are questions. So, to begin at the beginning, what is metaphysics? And then if we scroll down to the end, the uh, essay closes with another question. Why are there beings at all? And why not rather nothing? All right, deep question. Now, what, partly what's interesting about this is uh, that why is there something rather than nothing, or why are there beings rather than nothing? It's kind of a question that many philosophers uh, of a certain sort will say is an impossible question. It is, in fact, an illegitimate question. Uh, however you try to answer it, you at, uh, end up in paradox or snarled in some sort of contradiction, and contradiction is always the sign that you are making a mistake somewhere. So if I try to say, why are there beings and not rather nothing, uh, I could say, well, uh, you know, there's no reason why there's beings, uh, in which case to say the being just kind of exists for no reason, which is a kind of absurdity. Uh, or we can say, why are there beings? But in order to answer that question, we have to take being as a whole and somehow metaphorically step outside of being into nothingness, but what would mean that we're trying to explain being from nothingness, and that's also an absurdity. So uh, many philosophers will then say this is a kind of question that seems formulated like a question, but it's not really a question or it's an illegitimate kind of, uh, of way to, uh, to pose a problem. But that's not what Heidegger is, uh, is going to do. He's not going to reject it. In fact, he's going to turn the tables on those who think about the issue that way. So, uh, why? what is metaphysics? Well, the question awakens expectations of a discussion about metaphysics, and he says we're not going to do that. So we're not going to say here's metaphysics and step back and talk about metaphysics and kind of do meta metaphysics. Instead, we will take up a particular metaphysical question. So we're going to go into metaphysics and do some metaphysics. Uh, preparatory remarks. Uh, this is a very difficult enterprise, in part because you can't just take any given metaphysical question and consider it out of relationship to everything else. First, each or every rather metaphysical question always encompasses the whole range of metaphysical problems. Each question is itself always the whole. All right, and that's one interesting challenge here. And then, of course, we ourselves are part of the whole, so we are wrapped up in the very enterprise that we are trying to do. Therefore, second, every metaphysical question can, uh, can be asked only in such a way that the questioner as such is present together with the question that is placed in question. And so that's what we are trying to do. Now, uh, certain sorts of scientific enterprise will already be uh, indicating a kind of dismissal or, 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 or uh, a dismissiveness, rather, of this whole kind of presentation. Uh, instead of trying to do all of this uh, metaphysics, metaphysics over the course of the 1800s and on into the 1900s had uh, acquired kind of a, a, a reputation in many intellectual quarters for being pointless, kind of just this uh, uh, kind of speculation into word salad types of things, and that what we really need to do is just do science. We want to know what is, plunge into the sciences, and the sciences will tell us what is. And so Heidegger turns next to the status of the sciences. The scientific fields are quite diverse. So biology does this, chemistry does that, physics does this, that, and the other thing. Uh, and they have their own methodologies, uh, and we can see this in part 
uh, the way scientific departments at universities are carved up, put in different buildings, and, and so on. Nonetheless, the rootedness of the sciences in their essential ground has atrophied. So rather than just plunging into science, uh, the science here by this metaphor is going to be a stem or a leaf or a flower, we have to figure out what is the grounding right, or the, the, uh, the essential source right, of science. And uh, a certain approach to science, uh, Heidegger is indicating, has decided that's not a legitimate enterprise. We are not going to do that as a result from Heidegger's perspective. Um, uh, 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 science is then rootless, and that's a problem that he wants to, to take up here. Precisely from the point of view of the sciences or discipline, no field takes precedence over another. So science uh, in the form of physics in the, or in the form of biology or in the form of history or the form of uh, languages, one is not more important than the other. Right? One might uh, uh, have <clears throat> more exactness that is possible, but all of them are rigorous disciplines and they all have, so to speak, equal, uh, equal status uh, as sciences. And what Heidegger is then going to do is that all of the sciences together have a, uh, a derivative status and we need to find out what that mother discipline is out of which the science and the possibility of sciences is going to, going to emerge. So what we cannot do from this claim is, is say right, that science is, an excep is exceptional in that in a way peculiar to it it gives the matter itself explicitly and solely the first and last world. And that's what Heidegger wants to reject. The special relation science sustains to the world and the attitude of man that guides it can, of course, be fully grasped only when we see and comprehend what happens in the relation to the world so attained. Man, right, one being among others, pursues science. In this pursuit, Nothing less transpires than the eruption by one being called man into the whole of beings, indeed in such a way that in and through this eruption, breaks, beings break open and show what they are and how they are. So what we then have is uh, uh, man and what Heidegger wants to do is introduce a different concept or a different word rather for man. Man is one of those words or concepts that has acquired baggage over the course of the many centuries. And so his, uh, his substitute word is going to be design, kind of the being that is there or this being that is doing this eruption or entering into questioning uh, itself and its relationship to the world. Uh, so design is that concept. That from which every attitude takes its guidance are beings themselves and nothing further. So we're still going back to this science, just plunge into it. What are we trying to do? Well, we're just looking at the beings themselves and nothing, nothing else. We're not going to do all of this weird speculative metaphysics and, and word salad type of stuff. We're just looking at the beings themselves and nothing further. That with the scientific confrontation in the eruption occurs are beings themselves. And beyond that, nothing. There's nothing behind, above, beyond, underneath the beings that are. There's, there's nothing there. But what is remarkable is that precisely in the scientific way, or in the way scientific man secures to himself what is most properly his, he speaks of something different. What should be examined are beings only, and besides that, nothing. Beings alone, and further, nothing. Solely beings, and beyond that, nothing. So what we have then is a description of the scientific enterprise that wants to say we're doing a certain thing, but then it keeps throwing this other word out there in order to try to define itself at the same time, deny that there is something else that is necessary. But what about this nothing? The nothing is rejected precisely by science. We don't want to say, you know, kind of have to step into the nothing or think about the nothing in order to explain the beings that we are interested in scientists. We just don't want to, we don't want to go there. So Heidegger puts it uh, this way. If science is right, then only one thing is sure. Science wishes to know nothing of the nothing. And then he repeats that formulation. Science wants to know nothing of the nothing. And then the question then is going to be, is that the right attitude for Dasein to take? 
and then Dasein in his particular uh, instantiation uh, as, a, as a scientist, uh, uh, investigating a certain realm of beings or even going about ordinary life, can we so easily dismiss the nothing? So that's the question that we are going to elaborate. What is the nothing? And then we run into the standard paradoxes here. Interrogating the nothing, asking what and how it, the nothing, is, turns what is interrogated into its opposite. That's right, the part of the problem here. We try to say, well, what is the nothing? And then we start to, we want to kind of add some predicates to that sentence. Nothing is, but the only predicates that we could add there are going to be predicates that are not nothing. The predicates are going to be something. And so we're going to be uh, trying to turn the nothing into its opposite or running into paradoxes and just trying to formulate whatever it is. So the question deprives itself of its own object. Accordingly, every answer to this question is also impossible from the start, for it necessarily assumes the form the nothing is this or that. With regard to the nothing, question and answer alike are inherently Absurd. So one school of philosophy then wants to get to this point and say, anytime you have reached absurdity, you've reached contradiction, uh, uh, that shows that you've made a mistake. And so you set aside that as an illegitimate question. And so we don't talk about the nothing in this, in this particular way. But Heidegger is not uh, satisfied with that. It is not science's rejection that first of all teaches us this. The commonly cited ground rule of all thinking, the proposition that contradiction is to be avoided, universal logic itself lays low this question. And we'll notice here that Heidegger has put the word logic in the scare quotes, and that's always an indication of some uh, distancing from, uh, mocking of, or, or rejection of the concept in question. And we'll see that uh, 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 elaborated further as we as we carry on. So this this rule that we uh, we have to be logical, that we can't uh, dwell in paradoxes, that contradictions must be rejected. Uh, that then is to assume, as Heidegger goes on to say at the end of this paragraph, that's assuming that in this question, logic is of supreme importance, and that the intellect is the means and thought the way to conceive the nothing originally and to despite about its possible exposure. So can we question logic? Can we question the intellect? Uh, can we, uh, can we uh, uh, question whether thought, as we are, are, uh, are, are so uh, de uh, characterizing it here, is the right way to do metaphysics or to, and to approach this particular question? And so he then goes on to say, as uh, so a rhetorical question, we know his answer is going to be yes. But are we allowed to tamper with the rule of logic? And so if we're going to do so, uh, how are we going to do so? How then can we, in our question of the nothing, indeed in the question of its questionability, wish to brush the intellect aside? Can we set aside logic? Can we set aside the intellect? And Heidegger is wanting to say yes, and that's going to require some other method of investigation. And to that, we are going to, uh, going to next turn. We assert that the nothing is more original than the not and negation. So in uh, grammar, in logic, in intellectual thinking, we will use these words not and negation uh, merely as the opposite of that which is. Right? And so we will have an intellectualized version. Heidegger wants to say that's going to be somewhat superficial to get at the nothing that is more original than these merely verbal, logical, or grammatical knots and negations. We're going to need to do something else. So again, we're going to say, yes, this question does seem absurd from the perspective of logic and intellectual thinking, but that's not necessarily the end of the story. Does the ostensible absurdity of the question or of question and answer with respect to the nothing in the end rest solely on a blind conceit of the far-ranging intellect. So the idea that intellectually we should be figuring things out, that's a conceit, and it's a blind conceit. But if we do not let ourselves be misled by the formal impossibility of the question of the nothing, 
if we pose the question in spite of this. So we don't let logic, the intellectual, and, and, and this uh, more science-friendly way of thinking get in the way, then perhaps we can make some progress. If the nothing itself is to be questioned as we have been questioning it, then it must have be given beforehand. We must be able to encounter it. And so the question is going to be, how can we encounter this nothing uh, if we're going to set aside logic, intellectual uh, approaches, and, 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 and so forth? All right, well, what, what do we even mean by the nothing? Well, the nothing is not uh, you know, not this thing in particular, or not not that thing in particular. The nothing is the complete negation of the totality of being. So the totality of being. So perhaps being in the whole, or being or kind of with a capital B. It is the complete negation of of that. But here we have a problem. How should we, who are essentially finite, make the whole of beings penetrable? in themselves and especially for us. So we are finite beings. We're, when we use our senses or are aware of particular things, we're thinking of particular uh, concepts right, or words and we formulate formulations, but there's only so much that we can hold in our mind at a given time. So how can finite beings get to the totality of beings and then negate uh, uh, all of that or, the, or, or con encounter the negation of everything? That seems to be a bit of a problem. Well, we can, of course, conjure up the whole of beings as an idea and then negate what we have imagined in our thought and thus think it negated, but that's going to be a superficial, verbalistic way of doing it. In this way, we do attain the formal concept of the imagined nothing, but never the nothing itself. That's not going to work. So what we then need to do is find another way of trying to encounter and uh, uh, what he's going to do is suggest that it's going to be our emotions, our moods, perhaps certain passions or certain uh, uh, states of our non-intellectual being that are going to be metaphysically potent or metaphysically revelatory. So. Boredom, he uh, asks us to consider first as an emotion. And uh, if we think of ourselves as, as being bored, and in kind of common sense description, uh, you know, there's nothing in particular that in, engages us. So wherever it is in our surroundings or, you know, nothing hooks our attention. We don't get engaged with that particular thing. Or even if we're trying to think various thoughts, uh, we don't get, get hooked by any of those. And so our, uh, our, our, our senses and our minds and everything kind of just disengages from all of the particulars in our minds and, and around us. And we go into that state of boredom that we are well, hopefully all uh, uh, familiar with uh, at some point. So, but notice what Heidegger is saying here about boredom and what he means here is genuine boredom. Boredom is still distant when it is only this book or that play, that business or this idleness that drags on. It erupts when one is bored, right? but that's not quite what we are getting to. It might be a, an anteroom to real boredom or genuine boredom. Profound boredom, right? drifting here and there in the abysses of our existence, like a muffling fog, removes all things and men and oneself along with it into a remarkable indifference. This boredom reveals beings as a whole. Now that's interesting because you notice what we have here is uh, it's not just that I'm reading this book and I'm reading it and I'm following the words and thinking about it, but I'm kind of bored. I'm not particularly excited by that. This genuine boredom is uh, a more generalized disengagement, not just from this book, but from everything, everything in my mind, everything in the reality and everything about myself. And so what we have then is uh, I am not engaged with uh, anything in particular. And so what I am engaged with is beings as a whole. And so there's a cognitive shift and an affective shift that has taken place in me, in my state, when I reach this state of genuine boredom. Uh, generalized discussion here about feelings. What we call a feeling is neither a transitory epiphenomenon 
of our thinking and willing behavior. So that then is to say, it's not the case from Heidegger that for us human beings, that first and foremost, we are beings that think or beings that have a will and what we call feelings are secondary epiphenomena right? or are tacked on or side effects of those more fundamental things. We're going to argue that feeling is perhaps more fundamental to us than either thinking or willing. Nor is it simply an impulse that provokes such behavior, nor merely a present condition we have to put up with somehow or another. So feelings are, are not superficial things like that. So feelings have more substance, more significance, more uh, metaphysical potency than, than uh, many schools of thought will ascribe to us. And perhaps we substitute here the word mood. We get into certain moods and we notice what is revealed to us in those moods, particularly moods that seem to be nothing oriented. Such a thing could happen only in a correspondingly original mood. Is there a more original, fundamental mood that we can get ourselves into the state of, which is the most proper sense of unveiling reveals the nothing. So the nothing is going to be revealed to us once we get into a certain mood state, the right kind of feeling. It's not an intellectual enterprise. It's not a logic enterprise. It's not a science enterprise. And then he gets to another type of mood or another type of feeling that he thinks is especially significant. And notice he calls anxiety right, that fundamental mood, the fundamental mood of anxiety. And this is one of the reasons why Heidegger is often uh, an, an regularly categorized with the existentialists for whom uh, uh, feelings and moods uh, uh, are, are more fundamental to their understanding of our being to the human being, particularly negative moods. In this case, Heidegger is, uh, is, is, is sounding moods and feelings as fundamental and it's boredom, it's, uh, it's anxiety in this case. So what, what do we mean by anxiety here? But he makes a differentiation between anxiety and fear. Right? We become afraid in the face of this or that particular being that threatens us in this or that particular respect. So fear, he is saying, is always particular and localized. Right? I'm, 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 I'm afraid uh, I'm going to get fired. Right? I'm afraid uh, uh, that there's a, you know, a snake in my garden. I'm afraid that uh, I, 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 uh, my brakes will fail the next time I'm driving fast. So it's always a particular uh, uh, state of the world, and my fear is in response to that particular state of the world. So it's particularized. Anxiety is going to be much more general love. And so we, we get to this in the next paragraph here. Anxiety is indeed anxiety in the face of, but not in the face of this or that thing. Anxiety in the face of is always anxiety for, but not for this or that. The indeterminateness of that in the face of which and for which we become anxious is no mere lack of determination, but rather the essential impossibility of determining. So when I am anxious, I'm not anxious about anything in particular. It's kind of a more generalized anxiety. It's like the world in general or, or, or even people in general is going to be too specific. It's just this state of feeling that something's not right, something doesn't fit or whatever, but I can't put my finger on it and point out anything in particular that does it. Right. So it is a lack of determination of what I am anxious about, even though I'm anxious about something. All right. All things and we ourselves sink into indifference. Right. So my self dissolves, the world dissolves into a state of anxiety. My particularity falls away. The world and all of the particular beings fall away. And what is left is this state of anxiety about nothing in particular. And there maybe we have it. What is this nothing in particular? Anxiety reveals the nothing. We hover in anxiety. So we kind of stay in that anxious state 
for a while. This implies that we ourselves, we who are in being, in the midst of beings, slip away from ourselves. At bottom, therefore, it is not as though you or I feel ill at ease. Rather, it is this way for some one. So not only do the beings out there, uh, uh, things, right, uh, in particular, uh, it's not any of them that I can focus on as the source of, of, of my identity, but even myself, there's not anything about me in particular that I can focus on as the source of my anxiety. Instead, there's just this generalized state, some one undifferentiated being is anxious with respect to an undifferentiated reality or set of beings uh, about which I am anxious. The, in the altogether unsettling experience of this hovering, where there is nothing to hold on to, pure Dasein is all that is still there. And now we have made then metaphysical progress with respect to this nothing. With the fundamental mood of anxiety, we have arrived at that occurrence in human existence in which the nothing is revealed and from which it must be interrogated. So we have set aside logic. We have set aside the, the, the narrower scientific way of looking at the world. We are not using our intellects. Rather, what we are doing is exploring our feelings, letting ourselves get into certain states of boredom and boredom then shades perhaps into a kind of anxiety. The world slips away, my personal identity slips away, and I am left with nothing. And that is a metaphysically potent, metaphysically revelatory state. Carrying on, the response to the question, in be anxiety, rather, beings as a whole become superfluous. And now uh, Heidegger uh, then uh, sounds another note that uh, often leads him to be categorized with the existentialists about authenticity, about courage, about uh, not shrinking from the negative in the world, uh, and a certain kind of courage in facing up to this dissolution right, of oneself and the possible emptiness and nothingness of, of all of being. So, in, anxiety, sorry, in anxiety occurs a shrinking back before, which is surely not any sort of flight, but rather a kind of bewildered calm. This back before takes its departure from the nothing. The nothing itself does not attract. It is essentially repelling. And so there is a natural state of not wanting to go there, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm losing my sense of identity. All of reality or all of being seem to be slipping away. This is not a comfortable state. And so there's a, 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 a kind of a danger that I'm just going to run away from this whole line of investigation back to ordinary life. But we need in some sense to maintain this state if we are going to, to do metaphysics. Uh, the action of the nothing that oppresses design in anxiety is the essence of the nothing, nihilation. All right, so here we have nihil, uh, the Latin word for, for nothing, nihilation, and we're uh, getting to some sort of fundamental metaphysical realization. And, and of course, the word nihilism is, uh, is also hovering close in the, uh, in, in, in the uh, uh, state we are in at this point here. The nothing itself nihilates. So nothing is, uh, you know, here we're trying to, of course, use words to describe this feeling state that is going on, but it's a kind of activity, an activity of, 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 of making nothing, negating, uh, annihilating and so forth. So we have to play around with all of these linguistic forms and see which one of them feels best uh, to, uh, to capture this state. In the clear night of the nothing, of anxiety, the original openness of beings as such arises, that they are beings and not nothing. But only on the ground of the original revelation of the nothing can human existence and approach and penetrate, penetrate rather beings. And so here we find our core 
uh, don't want to quite use the word essence, right? Our core nature, also not really quite the right word, but who we are. The question as, as uh, 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 preoccupied philosophers, what is it to be me or what kind of being am I am? Dasein means being held out into the nothing. Being held out into the nothing. Holding itself out into the nothing, Dasein is in each case already beyond beings as a whole. This being beyond beings we call transcendence. So we get beyond particular beings, being as a whole, and we go out there. Out is, of course, a metaphor, but that transcendence of being as a whole, but still being me, but not me in the sense of my particular, being me in the sense of being one who is doing this, that's Dasein. Okay, the nothing does not merely serve as the counter concept of being. It's not a concept, it's not an intellectual formulation. It is much deeper than that. Rather, it originally belongs to their essential unfolding as such. In the being of beings, the annihilation of the nothing occurs. All right, so this is the metaphysical fundamentality. The nothing annihilates incessantly without our really knowing of this occurrence in the matter of our everyday knowledge. We've left everyday knowledge entirely behind. We are now in a transcendent state that cannot be captured in that uh, um, uh, everyday state. And so uh, what we have then done is shown, if we're going to get to this state, that clearly uh, some more superficial philosophies and understandings have been set aside. If the power of the intellect in the field of inquiry into the nothing and being is thus shattered, intellect, bah, set it aside, then the destiny of the reign of logic in philosophy is thereby decided. The idea of logic itself disintegrates in the turbulence of a more original question. So any intellectual objections, any logical objections, those can be just dismissed as superficial by people who just don't get it. All right, now, in, over the course of this next uh, section, Heidegger turns to placing his uh, uh, 1920s thinking in broader historical context. Obviously, metaphysics has been around for a long time, <clears throat> and uh, 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 different metaphysical traditions have beaten up on each other. And so he wants to rehabilitate a certain uh, uh, metaphysical tradition that uh, has uh, gotten a bad rap from the perspective of another metaphysical tradition. For a long time, metaphysics has expressed the nothing in a proposition clearly susceptible of more than one meaning. Ex nihilo nihil fit. From nothing, nothing comes to be. All right, so if we ask, where does the world come from? And we might say, well, the world was created out of nothing or came from nothing. And uh, uh, one, one, one metaphysical tradition will say, well, obviously that's, that's impossible. If you've got nothing, even if you've got like a whole bunch of nothing, you can't get anything from nothing. So you can't get being from nothing. And so being then is going to be one's fundamental. Beings are, and you start there, or existence exists, and you start from there. There's no above, behind, before, underneath, and so on. So we set aside the nothing and we just start with beings or, or existence. And Heidegger wants to argue that's not quite the way we want to, uh, want to or suggest perhaps is a better word than, than argue here. And then he goes to Christianity because, of course, uh, 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 the, uh, the doctrine of uh, creation out of nothing is one traditional uh, Christian form of doing metaphysics. On the other hand, Christian dogma denies the truth of the proposition ex nihil o nihil fit and thereby bestows on the nothing a transformed significance in the sense of a, the complete absence of beings apart from God. Ex nihilo fit ends creatum. From nothing comes created being. So we have the Christian metaphysics, uh, which wants to say that God created all beings out of nothing, and the other tradition that wants to deny that metaphysics and say that uh, is, is, uh, is impossible. 
And so what Heidegger then is indicating is that he's going to be more friendly to that traditional Christian uh, uh, way of doing metaphysics. And so rather it, that is to say, the way we have been doing it, uh, the, the, the investigation, awakens for the first time the genuine formulation of the metaphysical question concerning the being of beings. The nothing does not remain the indeterminate opposite of beings, but reveals itself as belonging to the being of beings. And then he cites the uh, uh, 1800s thinker Hegel, who on various interpretations had been very sympathetic to a kind of Christian metaphysics, but had somewhat secularized it, uh, trying to bring it into a more modern uh, uh, intellectual context. And he cites here a, a formulation from he uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Hegel's work on logic, quote, pure being and pure nothing are therefore the same. All right, so uh, Heidegger is, is uh, uh, arguing that Hegel is more sympathetic to Heidegger's approach and the Hegelian approach is more sympathetic to the Christian approach and that is the approach that is being rehabilitated against the, uh, the, the, the kind of approach to metaphysics that has dismissed that all together. The old proposition ex nihilo nihil fit is therefore found to contain another sense one appropriate to the problem of being itself that runs ex nihilo omne ens qua ens fit. From the nothing, all beings as beings come to be. So what we then have is the nothing is more fundamental and from the nothing comes being in general and then science comes later and is going to be more derivative. And so we come back to the question of science. Well, science would like to dismiss the nothing with a lordly wave of the hand. But in our inquiry concerning the nothing, it has by now become manifest that scientific existence is only possible if in advance it holds itself out into the nothing. So. Science is going to depend on metaphysics, but then metaphysics in order uh, the right kind of metaphysics, this metaphysics that takes the original fundamentality of nothingness uh, uh, as its starting point is going to be necessary and, uh, and the proper grounding for all of us. We cannot be transposed there at all because insofar as we exist, we are always there already, sorry, we are always there already. Quoting again approvingly Plato as uh, somewhat friendly to the kind of tradition of metaphysics that we are, we are in favor of as Heideggerians. So we are already in the right sort of state, but what we have to do is uh, set aside a certain kind of intellectualizing or intellecting at so, a certain approach to science, uh, and a certain approach to uh, reason that wants to argue that uh, uh, reason is, uh, is our fundamental mode of inquiry. Uh, in a moment, I'm also going to uh, put up a quotation from a 1943 essay from Heidegger with respect to this uh, attitude toward reason, the intellect, logic, and so forth, to show a continuity across Heidegger from his earliest mature works unto his late mature works. He, uh, there's a fundamental continuity runs through it here. But now we reach our closure. Philosophy, or what we call philosophy, is metaphysics getting underway, in which philosophy comes to itself and to its own uh, and to its explicit tasks. And so we are Dasein, we are beings, we are beings that are uh, also in this field of other beings, but we are in a sense a unique being in that we question uh, uh, other beings and, and get to the ground of all kind of being. That is to say, we do philosophy, but we need to do it a certain way. This insertion itself is of decisive importance. First, 
that we allow space for beings as a whole. And that means we have to get away from our preoccupations and localized emotions and concerns and values about this particular thing and that particular thing. You know, my friends, my career, my money, and so on. We have to get to being as a whole. And then second, that we release ourselves into the nothing, which is to say we liberate ourselves from those idols everyone has and to which he is wont to go cringing. When we do that, we get to the original metaphysical question, the fundamental question, why are there beings at all and why not rather nothing?